Welcome to Programming Throwdown, episode number two, Python. Take it away, Jason. Hey, how's it going? So, uh, how was your day today? Pretty good, pretty good. I've been practicing my radio voice. Oh, yeah? I've been, I've noticed that I turned to YouTube for, um, for learning just about anything. Like, I, I wanted to cook snow crab, so I went on YouTube and I saw how to cook it. And then I, I cooked it, but, you know, the snow crab has a really tough, you know, exoskeleton. Right. So I couldn't figure out how to get the meat out of the crab. So again, I turned on YouTube and put in how to eat the snow crab. Our brains are, have been offloaded to Google. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Anything I need to know how to do, uh, I've gone to YouTube. It's kind of sad. Pretty soon it's going to be like, how do I feed myself? <laughs> <laughs> how to flush toilet. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'll flush the toilet. I need to figure out a way to pull my pants up. You too. <laughs> oh, no. So I did, I, you know, I do realize when you write stuff down, it's good, but you don't remember it. Like if I write something down, I never remember it anymore because like I know it's written down. I don't need to remember it. So I guess once you look up how to learn how to eat snow crab, it's just always going to be online. You're never going to remember. Yeah, that's true. I saw a guy on, uh, wrote a book. I think it's called Moonwalking with Einstein. Uh, supposedly it's about a guy who uh, tried to become like the world or the US champion of memorization and I don't know I haven't read the book I just heard about it but uh, it sounded interesting I'm about to check that out because I always wanted to have better memory I'm pretty terrible at it oh nice did you see that uh, math the magician on Ted on the Ted talk no yeah so this guy uh, basically he built himself like a base 300 uh, number system where like he took a bunch of words and he associated them with with large numbers so he can do like really amazing things like he's like you know give me two six digit numbers and I'll multiply them in my head and uh, and he does it by converting each of the numbers to it might even be more than 300 but he has this whole lexicon and he knows that like slippers is 493 or whatever you know wow and so he converts your number to some really high base and then does the multiplication in his head and then converts that that's a cool parlor trick i guess and really awesome <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah this guy was like I mean, he goes around just, you know, I guess he's a motivational speaker too, or maybe that's all he does, but I guess that's how he makes his living. Wow. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, Mathematics. It's called Mathematics. Okay. We'll make sure to link to that video. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a great TED Talk. It's one of the best. Well, you know, it's it's more like entertainment than the other technology or design. Right. But, uh, but you tend to say that, that about category. almost every TED Talk you watch. This is the best. It's true. <laughs> It's true. It's like everyone you watch is like, oh man, this is life changing. And then you get to the next one. Although, you know, they've been going downhill. Yeah. Um, they franchised. You know, yeah, they franchised. And now, like, the TEDx talks sometimes take the front page. And you can just tell the quality isn't there, you know? Yep. All right. Well, you want to go ahead and get started with the news? Yeah, sure. So what's your uh, what's your news story? So the uh, first news story I had was uh, an interesting thing. Um, you know, had a little bit of delay in recording this podcast. So saw this a while ago, but I thought it was really interesting that with the new version of the iPhone OS, iOS, I guess iPhone and iPad and iTouch, but um, Apple had an upgrade to their JavaScript engine. And I don't know if they started calling it this or if this is what it's always been called, but I guess it's Nitro. Um, I know, I think Google's uh, is V8 or something. So everybody, I guess, has their own cool name for their JavaScript engine. But they made a bunch of performance updates to actually improve the speed of JavaScript on their iOS platforms. And uh, it did a really good job and everybody's pretty excited about it. But then people figured out that if you do, um, if you don't have an iOS device, you won't know this, but you can like bookmark a page, a web page to your desktop basically and um, run it from there. It's so, like if you double click on it, it's like a hyperlink and it just kind of runs it in the browser. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. So you can do that. Um, but I, I was missing. Some people just have apps that run um, basically websites from within the app. So they're kind of like an embedded browser or whatever, but they're really okay. just like um, Google's works this way. So Google's app mostly just, you know, references stuff on the internet. Uh, and if you're using, I think the way it works is if you're using the embedded browser instead of using, you know, natively written iOS stuff, you don't get the speed ups that they gave to oh, the, all the other Safari stuff. So it's kind of an interesting thing that they left out. I, I guess it could be a bug, but people are suspecting maybe they did that on purpose. 
So how does it, so the embedded browser, I guess it's just a completely different engine than Safari? Well, it's supposed to be the same same engine, I guess. Like it, it's supposed to be a, a version of embedded Safari like within that app. Oh, I see. So maybe it has more restrictions. Right. I guess they were saying for possibly for security reasons or something. But I thought that was oh, interesting that they, saying. yeah, uh, that they would, you know, kind of cripple those. Interesting. Because you can do with the HTML5 stuff, you can do a lot of things that you would normally do in a native app. Apple is always so paranoid about someone writing some app that compromises, you know, either the hardware itself or even worse, like your information, or your contacts or something like that. Right. So maybe in doing so, they left out, you know, some of these updates. Hmm. I always felt like, you know, there should be kind of like one browser engine to rule them all, you know, like, and I, and there's, it's kind of starting to head this way with WebKit. Like WebKit, WebKit is, I believe it's on the PlayStation and WebKit is part of, you know, Google Chrome. It's like the engine for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's no like just generic engine that isn't really tied to like a particular OS or anything like that. Like there's no there's no web engine that just writes to OpenGL or something like that. But I guess that's good because, you, you know, the competition between them, they drive features from each other. So kind of relating, spilling, transitioning into our next topic, um, you know, talking about the new release of Firefox 4 and IE9, that uh, they've both picked up, I guess, what was started with Chrome, I believe, with the, the tab styles, where instead of having the traditional file, edit, view, menu, whatever at the top, um, they just kind of have tabs at the top and they get rid of a lot of that extraneous stuff unless you go looking for it. Right. Um, so I guess that's good, right? Because if you only had one, it just would have always stayed kind of what it was. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I just, I feel, I think that because, you know, what they want to do is is tie into the theme of the particular operating system. So like in the case of Windows, if you change your theme, they want, you know, to that theme to be reflected in your browser windows, which makes sense. And so, yeah, and that that's fair. And but because of that, they're kind of tied to, um, you know, those particular OSs. So there isn't just some generic like write to a frame buffer or something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, web layout engine. So uh, have you downloaded the new Firefox? No, not yet. I want to. Uh, I actually I have the beta on one of my machines, and uh, it seems to run well. I haven't had any any crashes or anything with it but uh, one thing I have done is in Google Chrome I went ahead and um, changed my YouTube settings so that they use HTML5 instead of Flash Hmm. that was pretty cool Um, they didn't have the uh, like seeking in the video I don't know if maybe I'm using too old a version of Chrome or something but I have to play a video all the way through which kind of sucks but uh, but the support is there and I mean it's using the um, you know the on 4 I guess video codec or on 1 or something like that and uh, yeah, it works nice. Works well. Hmm. Yeah, so I've been using the Firefox 4 since, yeah, like, uh, I guess it's like beta 4 or beta 5 or something. Uh, it's been a while. And I kind of went upgrade. It was even pretty good back then. And yeah, it's been nice. I haven't really noticed that much difference to going to the actual, you know, now the full release. But um, yeah, I've been running it for a while and things have been nice. A couple of the plugins I like to use um, haven't been ported over yet, I guess. But other than that, I've had no problems. Oh, nice. Oh, it's called On2. On2 is the company that Google bought, and they created their own video codec called VP8. Oh, yes. Yeah. The interesting thing about it is there's no patents at all. I guess it's a completely different, um, you know, um, uh, setup or completely different algorithm than, you know, H.264. And uh, when Google bought it, they opened it up completely, which is which is really useful because anyone who's done video compression knows, or even audio MP3 compression knows what a nightmare that 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 stuff is. Yeah. With respect to patents and all that. An interesting thing I've uh, long abandoned Internet Explorer. I, you know, just been burned too many times in the past about terrible experience. But uh, I saw with the new release of Internet Explorer nine, uh, some of the JavaScript performance testing. Uh, actually showed that Internet Explorer 9 is the fastest browser in the West. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if, you know, Microsoft decided to really kind of pick it back up because they have just gotten so much flack. Nobody seems to like Internet Explorer. And remember that thing on the White House where uh, somebody asked um, Hillary Clinton if they could have Firefox in the White House? And she, you know, she clearly had no idea what firefox meant i mean for her it was like she thought that something was burning you mean the internet it's the internet no 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 the thing you use to access web pages yeah the internet 
So yeah, here we'll link to this video. I'll put it in the agenda. Okay. But yeah, it's a uh, a staffer asks Hillary Clinton why Internet Explorer is mandated, even though Firefox, which is free and is security approved, and uh, her answer was that saving money is complicated. <laughs> non-answer <laughs> that's funny all right uh so it looks like you got the next news item here yeah let's see so former goldman sachs employee goes to jail for eight years and so the deal is this guy uh you know he worked for goldman sachs he's making uh let's see here i think it was yeah four hundred thousand a year to write code for their high frequency trading um applications and so for people who don't know uh there are, you know, many of the financial institutions um, have computer programmers that go in and write software to trade at extremely high frequency. So what would you say, Patrick, like nanoseconds or something? Or yeah, I mean, it's yeah, sub millisecond trading times is the stuff I've seen. I'm not an expert by any means, but it's really fast, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of transactions a minute kind of stuff. Yeah, insanely fast. And I think they do arbitrage, but they also speculate, right? You know, in that short amount of time. Yeah. And uh, so this guy is writing the software that, you know, essentially becomes an arms race. Uh, you know, someone has this kind of software and then he writes this, you know, software that learns to exploit their software and so on and so forth. Um, They're paying him 400000 a year. And nice. uh, he decided that he was going to take his software over to a small company that they offered to double... I think double his salary um so uh he tried sneaking the software into that company he got caught wah, and wah, he got wah. yep eight years of federal jail time which oh. is serious business yeah, 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 <laughs> straight yeah. out of office space oh man okay uh <laughs> yeah we'll just move on um so don't steal code <laughs> ladies and gentlemen yeah Bad yeah idea. so this is interesting right for for several reasons one it's you know he didn't actually make any money off of it or steal any money um so in that respect it seems like eight years is extremely serious um ex you know but but this goes to show that uh you know people uh, in companies take this stuff extremely seriously and it's your responsibility you know as a as a software engineer to uh to you know be ethical in these types and not, and not try and pull these types of shenanigans yeah definitely that's hmm I mean, I guess it's good that it shows that, you know, he didn't get off easy for doing something that's, you know, stealing essentially the livelihood of the business. Not that I'm a big defender of the banks, but still. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's wrong. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you can definitely get hit hard. So <laughs> yeah. if anyone's thinking of uh, if anyone out there works for Goldman Sachs and is thinking of trying to pull a stunt like this, uh, this dude got eight years in federal penitentiary. So <laughs> if that's the average salary, $400,000 a year at Goldman Sachs, please donate to our show programming yeah, throwdown right. at gmail.com. Yeah. We'll set up a PayPal account just for you, <laughs> Mr. Goldman Sachs employee. Yeah. So, uh, oh, man, no, I'm just, uh, those guys work, they work crazy hours. So, and they've gone through a tough spat. So don't envy them. Yeah. No, this is this is hard times for everybody, and I'm sure those people are uh, are no exception. Right. So I have another news article. Do you have Do you have one now, or do you want to? No, go back I think we're I think or... we're done with mine. Okay. So this is kind of interesting. This was from Newswise, and uh, this guy wants to start uh, investigating. It's a professor, a young professor, and he wants to investigate green computing or energy efficient computing. And so you know, programming languages they usually serve you know one of several purposes uh one is you know let's say efficiency like in the case of c or c plus plus where you just you really need to push data through or do some you know expensive computation or they work on the you know they try and maximize productivity so python one of the languages that we'll be talking about t uh, later today is sort of focused on productivity and uh trying to save your time and be be programmer efficient if you will uh, no one really that I know of has up until now looked into this energy efficient computing. Um, so this is really quite interesting. And as we're moving to mobile devices and in general, as as being green is kind of in right now, uh, this was, you know, this has wind written all over it from a from a professor standpoint. Yeah. So he got some really nice grant money and I uh, thought this was this was pretty cool pretty cool stuff i like to see kind of what comes out of it that's interesting so uh, you know in compiler optimization you can compile for code size compile for speed compile for memory footprint now i guess you're gonna have a compile for energy yeah i mean what That'd does that cool. mean 
I mean, I guess in a superficial sense, you try to limit the number of instructions. Um, but then even then, I mean, you know, you might try to get more cash hits. Maybe that saves energy. I'm not really even sure. Those are, but those seem things that would, you would do already just to improve performance. I, I guess yeah, if you're true. willing to sacrifice, mm, this would be a hard thing to do. But if you're willing to sacrifice, you know, kind of the deterministic execution speed, you could, you know, do things like pausing and uh, collecting up all the disk accesses or RAM access accessing at one time and kind of do them all in a bundle, even if it means waiting to do it. But it seems like they kind of already try to do that. Yeah, it's hard to think of things that are energy efficient, but not, um, but that don't increase productivity. Um, trying to think of something off the top of my head. I, I mean, I've heard before, this is at a much, much lower level, but the whole idea, which is extremely fascinating, and if you want a time sink of... Uh, black hole of your uh, effort for the next couple of days look into reversible computing really so the idea I've of never even heard so of that there's this whole and i'll quickly show how much i don't know to anybody listening who knows anything about this field but um i guess it comes down to kind of information theory that one of the reasons why we're hitting an upper limit on the density of um you know transistors and and doing stuff in our chips and is that when you do an operation, so like an and, right? So you do one and one is one, one and zero is zero, but zero and one is also zero. So you're l losing some information there. That that operation's not reversible. Neither is an or. Um, most of the operations are not reversible. A not is reversible, right? Because you just not it back. So that you don't actually lose any information. So the idea is that when you destroy information, that is kind of somehow related to energy. And so when you lose information, you know, kind of destroy it, you're going to expend energy. That that information has to go somewhere and it dissipates into heat or whatever. Um, and so the idea with reversible computing is to say, if you can kind of keep track of all these sets of operations and be able to at some level undo it, and you kind of accumulate this log of everything, um, that you'll run more efficient. And then at some point you could kind of choose to get rid of all the information, all the bits you don't need, and kind of exude power at that point at, on your terms and your choosing. Uh, it's very, it gets very weird, and the information theory gets crazy. It gets tied in with like, you know, black holes. I think you just blew my head. <laughs> <laughs> black blew holes destroyed. Do they destroy information or not? Um, yeah, it, it, oh. And then there's the Maxwell's Damon. Oh. I guess there's like several. So you sure that you're saying there's a bunch of instructions that don't destroy information, and those cost less energy or cost no energy. So I, I don't. The way I've seen it explained is with billiard balls. So you can make an end gate out of billiard balls, but you can also make um, that that kind of you end up with. So if you do an and, you end up with the output of the and, and also like another bit that represents to distinguish between the zero one one zero case. So you end up with this extra bit of information oh, that I kind see. of allows you to know how you got to having the the zero, whether it was from two zeros, a zero one, or a one zero. And so you kind of record, or maybe you end up, yeah, maybe you end up with three bits. Uh, somehow you end up tagging along that extra information that allows you to reverse the computation. Anyway, like I said, it's a time sink. I don't really understand it, and I probably just made a bunch of people who know what they're talking about uh, realize how stupid I am. But that's okay. No. I think you just made them angry, which is okay. That's one of the goals. Yes. If, if we can't teach you something, we at least want to piss you off. Uh, write, write to us and tell <laughs> us how we messed it up, and maybe we'll get you on yeah, the show right. and have you explain it to us for reals. <laughs> yeah, that's right. If you hate us, uh, give us five stars. That's the worst rating you can give us <laughs> on iTunes. <laughs> so um, this is so I, I think also not just extending. You know, he's in this particular article. They're talking about making Energy Java, which is an extension of Java. That would somehow be more energy efficient, but also more uh, different languages, I think, would be inherently more energy efficient, um, provided that you're uh, running on a multi-core system. And so, so for example, uh, you know, a GPU, uh, you know, per per watt or whatever, can can deliver a lot more computation than a CPU, but it has uh, limitations because uh, you know, for example, all the cores in a GPU have to execute the same instruction at mm -hmm. the same time. So if you can, if you have a programming language or a construct that um, sort of helps guide you to work within those limitations, then maybe something that is like very highly multi-threaded um, could, you know, allow you to save energy. Because that's really where a lot of the energy is wasted and is, is in the bottleneck where you have this huge bank of memory 
but then only one small tiny sliver of it can be used at one time on a single core processor. Hmm. I guess that's why we have research, right? So if we knew the answer, we wouldn't need to research it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, this is a news article on Brainiac, and it was on the origins of Oregon Trail. And uh, I don't know if you had this or if this was just something we had in Canada, but in Canada we had uh, uh, these Apple IIe's. You know, there was like a computer, uh, uh, computer. I don't know. I guess using period in school, and we'd jump on these Apple IIe's and play Oregon Trail mm-hmm. and Odell Lake. And did you guys do that? Yeah, to some extent. Yeah, we did. Oh man, yeah. So it's just good memories. Like and... uh, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Oh yeah, that one was fantastic. And uh, this article is talking about just Oregon Trail, where it came from. It's actually programmed or, and uh, designed by um, um, by some teachers who just happened to be really geeky and into coding. And uh, they were inspired by Choose Your Own Adventure books. And uh, it was really, you know, the thing about Oregon Trail is it's a complete simulation. I mean, it's, you know, it's very uh, egocentric. Um, it's not like other wagons are passing you by or anything like that. Um, but, you know, in the sense that, you know, you're traveling along this trail and you're having to deal with hunting for food and the uh, environment can influence, you know, the hunting grounds and things like that. It's almost a complete complete simulation, which makes it just very interesting that something, you know, this old, that old could be that powerful. Yeah, I, a lot of people seem to remember that. Uh, most people our age kind of remember playing it. You, you've got dysentery. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's funny. In fact, the uh, the news article has a caption or has a figure, and uh, yeah, the figure clearly states that Nicole has dysentery. <laughs> and uh, you can go on uh, virtualapple.org. I don't know if you've ever been on the no. site. Oh yeah, it's great. Uh, www.virtualapple.org, and it has a number of um, you know Apple IIe um, games. I'm not sure. It says that it's copyrighted, all rights reserved, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not sure what the legality of it is. Um, but, you know, it seems legitimate. It doesn't seem like it's, that they're, you know, they're doing anything illegal. Maybe they have permissions. I'm not sure. But the Oregon Use Trail is on there. Risk. Yeah, that's right. Oregon Trail is on there. Odell Lake is on there. And it's actually a Java applet. So someone built an Apple IIe emulator in Java and uh, runs right there in the browser. It actually might even be a browser plugin. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I don't want to open this yeah. up right now. I'll end up messing You'll up, end up our on Skype. the trail. I'll end up messing up our <laughs> Skype connection and or, man, get that deer. Get the deer. Get the deer. <laughs> yeah, ah, right. I should have fjorded the river. <laughs> oh, yeah. Remember, there was one where, uh, yeah, I, oh, mean, I guess I had no idea. Never mind. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, at, at nine years old, you know, we had no idea. So there was this river. It was like, uh, I don't know, Swanee River. I don't remember. But it was it was something like, like 20 feet deep and i was like oh yeah just ford it just walk across it you know and then you, know, you lose everything you have you been up, washed away you end up crying at recess yeah oh, okay we're nerds all right <laughs> so my tool of the day is uh, a cool distributed version control system so you know in the vein of uh git mercurial um what are the other big ones there's a, a couple other ones but um a subversion well subversion's not distributed though Oh, that's right. So, right. Um, so distributed ones. But this one's interesting. So the thing I kind of like, and I've been trying to do better about, um, it's not really the new year anymore, but my semi-New Year's resolution for the last couple of years <laughs> has been to do better about version control at home slash for personal stuff. And uh, one of the nice things, Subversion so has some tools will let you do that, but it's not really set up to do that. The nice thing about the distributed stuff is that that's kind of how it always is is you can just have a repository on your local machine. And then at some point you kind of merge repositories with other people who um, could have previously, you know, had a version from yours and they kind of split up and move throughout. There isn't a one central repository that's the repository everybody refers to. Um, So that kind of confuses people, makes it a little bit hard. Um, And I'm not an expert by any means on version control, much less distributed version control. But Fossil is nice because it's a single executable um, that you you put in your path and you're able to. So I use it on Windows and you're able to like check stuff in and out and there isn't a complicated, you know, system behind it. Uh, I've used Mercurial before and and get to some extent and they're they're nice, but they're kind of, you know, tangled up in. They do a lot more. This, I, you know, I guess it probably does a lot, but it's really simple. Just, you know, one executable, really basic. And I've been using it to do, um, you know, version control on my local computer for stuff that I 
should have been always using stuff for and, and just haven't really been doing. This looks nice. I have had so much grief with Git um, using GitHub. The, I've gotten to the point now where I use the um, I use the Tortoise Git to mm -hmm. do a Git commit because I like that interface better and it integrates with Explorer and all all that good stuff. But then I have to use the Git GUI, which is a separate program that comes with Git, to do the push. It has something to do with, like, I could never get the SSH key working right mm. in Tortoise Git. And I've, I've just, it seems like I just have so much trouble with Git. So this this looks awesome. I'm definitely going to check this one out. Yeah, so, I you know, like I said, I'm not an expert, but I liked it. And it has the ability to set up a server within it. So, like, you know, I could put it open and then um, somebody else on my network could, you know, download my repository or whatever and clone it. So it's nice. I like it. It's worth looking into. So what would you say is the difference between a distributed version control system and just a regular version control system? Uh, I'm going to really get people mad at me now. Quiz mode. <laughs> I, I'm really going to get people mad at me because I'm ashamed to say I'm not very uh, polished on my knowledge of version control. But, um, no, me neither. So. so the way I understand it um, is, you know, Subversion, CVS, they kind of work on the idea of a central repository. There's one location that is the master. And you, um, depending on your workflow and the exact nature of the system, you check out files or, you know, get a copy of the repository, work on it on your own, and then you submit back to that central repository. So you can, like, lock files there, um, you know, work on them, and then resubmit them back with changes. And then other people go check against that, can pull changes, um, you know, do, do their updates, fix stuff, whatever. Um, the difference with a distributed version control system uh, is that certain operations which are complicated to do um, in one of these others are become very easy to do, like branches. Branches are really easy to do. Um, and having oh, multiple versions of the code existing at one time, like you know, eight different kind of parallel paths going at one time isn't really a big issue. Uh, and the way that you do, and even on your computer having multiple versions is easy because there is no central repository uh, you can have one, right? Like you and I could say, oh, we're going to, you know, host, uh, you know, on GitHub. That's our, you know, official repository. But in reality, it's just another version of the repository. And everybody's is just as important or um, authoritative as anybody else's. And so, for instance, I could um, push to you my changes. You can make them in your repository and then you could push them up to the GitHub server. Um, I don't have to push oh, them up to the GitHub server. You get them, bring them back down. We can like share with each other and co-mingle those because there is no, you know, one branch that everybody has to come down from. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, in Subversion, if you were to create a new branch, you would have to go to the master server and say, hey, I want you to split, you know, and make a new branch for me. Whereas it sounds like with this system, um, you're making your own branch and and uh, it has nothing. You don't need the server's permission and the server doesn't even know you have your own branch. Right. Per se. Right. And I can make multiple revisions, multiple check ins against myself for those to you. You merge some changes, do additional and then you merge back to the quote unquote, you know, central, you know, authoritative, whatever base. And um then if you actually look at the, it's kind of cool when you look at the, you know, version history, you see all these merges and splits and you can do things that would just cause a nightmare under most repositories. Oh, nice. That's good stuff. I'm definitely going to check out this fossil. That's awesome. So, so yeah, I guess my, what is your tool, uh, my tool of the, of the week? day, my tool of the day, or I guess of the bye week isn't, uh, <laughs> bye isn't quite as cool. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh my sorry. gosh. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> My cool, my uh, my tool doesn't have fossils or tiger blood, sadly. Um, but it is it is actually extremely useful. I've been using it for a while now, and uh, it is I think it's fantastic. It's called uh, Unison, um, and specifically I'm talking about the Unison file synchronizer. And so what this does is <clears throat> you give it two directories, and they could either be local directories, or um, one can be an FTP, uh, one could be an SSH. Um, you know, an SSH uh, location on a you know remote server, and it essentially compares the two directories recursively, and then gives you a list of changes. And it can do this in a variety of different ways. Um, it can compare the dates. It can actually compare the content. And uh, in the end, it presents you with this list. If one of the files is newer on one of the directories than the other, it will automatically suggest to you know move the newer file over to the older one. Uh, and vice versa. Hmm. Um, otherwise, if it can't figure it out, 
either because it doesn't have access to one of the dates or gets confused or something like that or or if uh, both dates both files have been modified since the last time you ran unison then uh, then it will put up a little question mark and you can make the call on do you want to diff these two files manually and merge them together that way or do you want to just pick one file or the other nice. um, in general it's great for synchronizing uh, your USB stick so if you have a bunch of docs uh, or a bunch of files on your USB stick um, you don't want to run the risk of losing the USB stick and losing all of that data permanently right. so you can run this unison program and put your USB stick and then put a directory on your on your hard drive and it will sort of keep everything in sync very cool very cool I've actually been looking for something like this um, not quite like this. this is interesting that ours are almost tied together almost like version control for your USB stick but uh, that's funny yeah. that I almost made the same thing but um <laughs> so I don't know if you used Dropbox before but Dropbox you know uses their server in the cloud to kind of take data from a folder store it there and also push it out to other folders kind of keeping them all linked up together um, right and I've been looking for a version that I could host like in my home network and do the same thing across all my computers. So like keep all of my my documents oh, you know, synced up together. And there's no you can do it with Dropbox like that'll work fine. But there's a limit um, to their free size, and you have to pay if you want more. And I kind of just want something that you know I don't care about how much data it's syncing across. Uh, and I found one, but they're not in release yet, and I haven't tried it yet. But it's called Sparkle Share. Um, and that's kind of that. It doesn't help you with like USB sticks like you're talking about, but keeping, you know, multiple computers in your household synced. Like I'm constantly moving from my desktop to my laptop and I would love to be able to just know that all the files are on both and not have to worry about, oh, that's on my laptop. I need it on my desktop. Let me email it to myself or put it in a USB stick or whatever that's. Like. Yeah, this is interesting. This is good stuff. So, yeah, it seems like, you know, it shouldn't be that hard. Like they have to kind of hook into the OS. But uh, whenever they see that, you know, a certain file has changed in a directory that they're monitoring, they can, you know, go and propagate, you know, and give that file to everybody else. It's one of those apps that seems kind of straightforward, but then the devil's probably in the details there, Definitely. especially if you want to make it run on Mac and Windows and, and reliably. Samba and Yeah, reliably. And it has to recover, like if your machine... You know, if one of the machines goes down when it comes back up, it'll have to try to, you know, get him back in sync and all that. Right. Not not trivial, but if somebody could do it in an open source package, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, well, is it time for the throwdown of Python? I think so. Let's throw it down. So, uh, I guess I'll cover this. So, Python is a interpreted language. Um, it is semi-compiled, which means that um, there is a Python virtual machine um, similar to Java, and you can compile Python files into um, bytecode for that virtual machine. Um, so in that sense, you know, it can take advantage of compiling, but overall it's generally interpreted um, language. And uh, the goal of Python is productivity. So Python um, boasts, you know, a 4x increase in, in productivity. So in other words, if it takes you uh, four weeks to write some app in C or C++, then, uh, you know, in theory, you can write it in a week in Python. I assume that would be an experienced Python person could write it in a week in Python. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> this doesn't have magical powers, does it? Uh, I think it does. I think genies come out and actually plug in, you know, little Bluetooth USB keyboards and just write alongside of you as you're writing. What? <laughs> Where has this no, been you're... all my life? I know it's the genies. They're just they're there. I think that yeah, you're right. You you have to be experienced in Python, um, and it's one of those languages that does come with a learning curve. Uh, one of the big things about a lot of these high level languages um, like Python is that um, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, but because it does that, you can kind of hang yourself with all the rope that it gives you, and uh, so that's why you know having a strong foundation in uh, one of the imperative languages kind of will allow you to sort of remain grounded in your in your architecture um, even with you know all of the flexibility that Python gives you. So why is it named Python? Oh that's a great question. Do you know the answer to that or are you just oh, are you quizzing I, it's me? It's a uh, Monty Python reference. No way. Yep. Is that oh wow yeah. I have to look that up. No definitely so any pro I figure any programming language that uses Monty Python references sprinkled throughout has to be good. <laughs> That's true. Or at least British. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yep, you're right. Oh, uh, what? Oh, hang on. Theme music. 
theme music? Where is it? <laughs> you're like, <laughs> you're uh, uh, that's gonna get saved. Like that's gonna be dubbed out now. Whenever we have an argument, you're gonna bring that back. Yeah. Remember um, about the Python. <laughs> Interesting. So yeah, so let's talk a little bit about more about Python. It's garbage collected, similarly to Java. So. In other words, you don't have to, you know, as you might remember from our C podcast a couple of weeks ago. Um, in this case, you don't have to, you know, tell the um, tell the system when to allocate in free memory. Um, you just say, hey, you know, I have this list of data, I have this dictionary, and uh, you know, the dictionary of of uh, it's a dictionary of phone numbers, and I want the phone number of Joe to be, you know, nine 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 nine, and it automatically decides. I'm going to create a dictionary. I'm going to allocate memory for that dictionary. There's a new entry. Maybe I have to increase the size of the dictionary to handle the new entry. It does all of that. So you're completely oblivious to the to the memory manager. Sounds powerful and dangerous. Yeah, I mean, definitely. If you're working on a system that doesn't have a lot of memory, um, such as you know an embedded device, um, you know you have to watch out for you know running out of memory. And in fact. Uh, with Python, this is especially an issue because it has a virtual machine. I believe the virtual machine has a memory limit. So, you know, in the case of C++, you can, for the most part, allocate memory uh, and just keep on going, keep on allocating memory, and it'll eventually start, you know, putting memory, uh, what's called virtual memory. It'll start creating memory regions on your hard drive, but it'll essentially give you the freedom to do whatever you want. Now, in the case of Python, there's a hard limit in the virtual machine and uh, if you try and allocate I don't know 27 gigs of memory uh, it's just gonna throw up it's going to cause an error in the virtual machine hmm so I see this phrase batteries included what does that mean yeah so <clears throat> so Python comes with a the Python standard library and uh, the Python standard library is actually just extremely massive so yeah one module in the in the library is uh, Pickle, which I'll talk about a little later for doing serialization. It has Zlib. So if you've ever had a .tar .gz file, uh, if you've ever downloaded one of those off the internet, um, that's using Zlib, and Python supports that natively. So just let's look at that for example. Let's say you wanted to write a C program that opened a .tar .gz file, or let's say you wanted to write a C program that created one of those. Um, you would uh, you would have to go grab the Zlib library, uh, you know, compile it along with your code, uh, you know, read up on the API and work your way through that. Uh, with Python, all that stuff's included, so mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about building Zlib and what sort of you know compile parameters you need to give it and things like that. All that stuff's in there. It uh, it has you know comma separated values for writing stuff that could be read by Excel. It's got hashing. Um, just tons of JSON encoding and decoding, email handling. It actually, the Python standard library has a HTTP web server built into it. So you can host your own website using just Python. So you can get hacked without even needing an extra library. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> That's right. You can have your, uh, you can have your, uh, uh, you know, users' email addresses leaked like TripAdvisor did earlier today. Oh. Without uh, without anything but Python. <laughs> so that's so, that's uh, cool. That's cool. Now, the fact that it has all these all these libraries is there good documentation for those? Yeah. So there's docs.python.org, which is um, you know Python's own uh, you know, documentation system, and that is extremely comprehensive. Um, and I think you've also found a couple of. Uh, websites to kind of learn Python as well, right? Yeah, Patrick? so, you know, under the kind of one of our charter goals here is that help people, you know, see the uses of other languages. So, for instance, we talk about Python being, um, helping you be more productive, potentially. Uh, and so as part of that, you got to learn those languages so that you can exploit the benefits to the fullest. So we talk about, you know, a little bit about our experiences, if we have any, with learning the language. And um, one interesting thing, if, you've, uh, if you're listening to the show and you don't yet know any programming languages, uh, I think a lot of people will consider Python a good first one to learn. What do you think, Jason? Yeah, definitely. I think that, um, uh, I think Python was one of the, you know, goals of Python was to sort of be simple to, to use and to understand. And it seemed like there was an, almost an educational focus um, um, to Python. And uh, <clears throat> because of that, I think that, uh, yeah, Python would definitely be a great starter language. Um, one of the things that you really have to watch out for in languages like C and C++ are 
dealing with these sort of these really high level structures and manipulating structures and memory and reading and writing structures to files can be challenging. And so Python obfuscates all of that from you. I mean, you don't really have to deal with with um, a lot of that low level stuff and you can get right to doing what you want. I mean, typically, you know, what people want to learn programming so that they can so that they can do something, so that they can accomplish something, whether they want to write their own um, you know, a little web calendar to keep themselves focused or whether they want to just kind of make a game or something to entertain themselves and their friends. And you don't want to get bogged down in a lot of the details, especially as a beginning programmer or working on a project by yourself. And so Python really does a lot of that heavy lifting for you, you know, at the expense of being slower than uh, one of the more low level languages. Yeah, definitely. And um, so my first kind of learning link that I had here is something I ran across. And of course, already, you know, having a fair amount of experience with programming, this was, you know, not not that helpful to me, but it was really interesting. And uh, I believe the guy who started this, but it's kind of a, a community effort now, I think is I think his name's Zed, Zed Shaw, maybe. Um, and he has Learn Python the Hard Way. Um, and we'll, we'll include the link in the show notes, but it's learnpythonthehardway.org. And it's kind of interesting. It's a book and it kind of goes through and says, look, this is going to be confusing. When you learn these programs, it's not going to be easy and straightforward. So he kind of starts out by going through stuff that, you know, would have kind of been nice in the, I remember learning, um, you know, programming kind of on my own without, before going to, you know, you know, school for it or having a class on it. And uh, it's, he kind of takes you through what I think a lot of people end up doing, which is, you know, type this code in. You're going to make mistakes, but type it in, you know, just copy this code into a thing. Don't copy and paste it, type it in and you're going to mm -hmm. begin to kind of understand, become familiar and intuit what the programming, what the programs are doing. And then also that'll kind of, since you've typed it in, you'll kind of lead you to experiment and start trying little things and seeing how it changes or reacts or what breaks. Um, and kind of approaching it from that way, which is an interesting way. I, I hadn't really, I, it's a refreshing take on how to learn programming. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I'm definitely going to have to give that a shot. So um, the other the other uh, resource I had here is PyCon, which is the, Py the big Python conference. Um, I think just recently the 2011 PyCon happened. I think it was in Atlanta. Oh. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And uh, the next one, 2012, is going to be in Santa Clara, California, which is right next to Google, right next to Mountain oh. View. Now, actually, that's a good point. Um, Google uses Python a lot, right? Yeah, so Google has employed the uh, creator of Python, Guido von Rossum. I believe he worked at a number of, um, you know, large, well-known companies. But uh, right now he's uh, he's been employed by Google. And Google is definitely uh, taking Python seriously. They're one of only two um, diamond-level sponsors of PyCon um, 2011. And so, um, yeah, they're definitely Who's the other one? It. The other one is QNX. Oh, I think that's uh, embedded, right? Art and embedded. RTOS, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Why don't you explain RTOS for a bit? I know it's kind oh, of a digression. That's to but... totally not related to Python, really. But, uh... <laughs> Maybe here I'll do it really quick. Okay. Basically, uh, you know, most people are familiar with OSs, operating systems like Windows, Linux, uh, you know, OS X, etc. Um, RTOS stands for Real Time Operating System. And uh, to make a long story short, basically. Um, they have certain, they operate within certain limitations. So uh, in the case of Windows, uh, again, going back to this memory thing that I talked about earlier, if you want to allocate, uh, you know, a gig of RAM uh, and you don't have a gig of RAM on your machine, it'll go into virtual memory. So it'll make a space on your hard drive for, uh, to, and treat that space as memory. So a uh, real-time operating system has certain limitations, like you cannot do something like that because it would take away from the real-time nature. It just takes too long to do something like that. Uh, and so there's many other, it gets complicated, but the basic gist of it is that they're interested in high-performance, low-power um, operating systems. Interesting. So, yeah, the, actually that gets to an interesting point, which is, uh, another lesson of this is it's true that Python has a reputation well suited for, for being slow. Um, but again, it comes down to how the, um, how the language is used and, you know, a lot of the algorithms that are going into the language. So in other words, you can write uh, some code in Python, someone else who uh, can write the same code in C and it could be a hundred times slower. 
um, just because of the way that you designed your algorithm. Um, let's say they're constantly creating and deleting arrays. And in your case, you were able to use just one single array. So, you know, a lot of the speed um, issues can be solved algorithmically or using, uh, you know, being efficient in the way that you allocate and deallocate memory. And, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about Python uh, being, you know, slower than other languages. Yeah, I, I, I mean, especially for, you know, prototyping or um, even in full up production style, I mean, using it as kind of like the scripting aspect. Uh, and we haven't talked about this yet, but Python integrates really well with C code. Yep. So you can, of course, you know, one of the good paradigms to go by in your programming is don't optimize too early. Don't worry about getting your code to run fast. Get, worry about getting it to run first. Yeah, Donald Knuth, right? The uh, one of the founders of computer science said, uh, "Premature optimization is the root of all evil." <laughs> so, ah. yeah, definitely. And I, I think that I think that you know to sort of extrapolate on that point, you know, uh, the biggest thing I see with uh, like a lot of kind of new or or green engineers is that they'll write some code. Uh, it will be slow, and they'll sort of look at things which are somewhat myopic, like maybe if I do a compiler optimization, or if I change languages, or but really, you know, there's something fundamentally slow in the algorithm or in the architecture that that can give you just a gigantic speed up. Definitely, and being aware of how the computer operates, which we don't have talked about here yet, but I mean, understanding at a fundamental level why your computer does what it does how it ticks, yeah. even down to, you know, not that you have to go that far, but that we were talking about AND gates and OR gates a few minutes ago. But I mean, understanding a computer at that level helps you write code that uses a computer in the best way possible. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So uh, do you want to talk about, oh, go ahead. Well, sorry. So, so we got in a little bit of a rabbit trail, but um, so <laughs> yeah. PyCon, the Python conference, just finished okay. up in Atlanta and um, they actually, and I, I don't know if they posted all of them, but they have a lot of videos uh, recordings of their sessions post online um, and we'll post a link but it's pycon.blip.tv and I've been watching a few of them and they're they're actually pretty good quality and, and really interesting so you know if you've always wanted to go to a conference or never thought about going into a conference um, and you look at the topic list and see some interesting things there uh, go check it out and uh, watch some videos most of them are you know 30 minutes to an hour in length and um, talk about everything from everyday parts of Python and panels on what's the best IDE to use for Python all the way to like really you know specific optimization you know kind of libraries and techniques yeah, this gets to kind of a little digression, but I think an interesting point, which is, you know, many of you out there work for, um, you know, tech companies or uh, maybe IT companies, but work, you know, sort of in the software engineering uh, industry. And, uh, you know, you should definitely, um, you know, ask the, uh, the you know, your management if they can send you to PyCon or one of these um, conferences. Um, you know, that's sort of a win-win. I mean, most of the time, uh, most companies have a budget for training, and very often people don't take advantage of the budget, and that money gets wasted. Um, you know, by going to one of these trainings, you can learn a lot about Python or, or something else, um, and you can also uh, you also become more valuable. I mean, your 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 uh, employer knows that you know you've went and gained the skill set, or you've went and uh, you know gained some connections with with the top people in a certain field or in a certain topic. And uh, you know that can really help you down, help you uh, help you along further down the road. It's an investment. Yeah, uh, hopefully people's jobs are uh, amenable to those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah it never hurts to ask, right? What are they going to do? Tell you no? Yeah, I mean, worst case, they tell you no. At least you know, even by asking, you uh, you can you know remind them that you're inquisitive. You know, I think that it's useful. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think we could all stand to be told no a little more often. Oh yeah, that's right. What is it you're trying to? I think your your metric was to get told no once a day, right? Yeah. So this was an interesting thing um, on Hacker News a while ago. I, I haven't seen anything about it recently, and I don't remember exactly how they phrased it. But it boiled down to this guy came out and said, you know, we we assume too much in our lives about restrictions and barriers placed on us, and so if you just make it a goal every day to get told no. On something, anything, you know, not a silly thing, but an actual something get told for real no, um, that you will learn quickly that people don't, we're trained from very young age not to say no to people. Um, so, for instance, he 
I think one of his examples was he was in the, some big city and took a cab ride and said, oh, I forgot my wallet or, or was getting in the cab and said, oh, I forgot my wallet. Do you mind taking me, you know, for free? And the guy's like, oh, OK, you know, just kind of <laughs> like, you know, didn't want to tell him no. Or he would wander around areas that looked restricted and people would come up to him and say, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, I don't know. I'm just wandering around. And he's like, you know, do I need to leave? And they're like, kind of, um, but they had a really hard time telling him like, yes, you need to leave. Um, so this is, his, this is his, amazing. Yeah. So his thing is, you know, go to your boss and ask, you say, well, no, I don't want to be told. No, they're going to think I ask too much. Well, go ask. Cause you don't know, like Jason pointed out, they probably have a budget for it. And if that budget's not getting used, it'll disappear. So they may in fact be glad to send you to the conference. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about virtual machines. Um, yes. Python is kind of interesting in that, uh, it actually has several different virtual machines and uh, they all have kind of really unique purposes. Um, so the first and the most common is C Python. And this is, well, um, well hang, hang on. Oh, go ahead. So what is a virtual machine? Oh yeah, this is a good question. So <clears throat> a virtual machine, and I'm probably going to butcher this because I'm not going to work. It's okay. I did it twice anything. already this time. So it's your time <laughs> to sit into the hot seat for a minute. Oh man, I'm in the hot, I'm sweating. So the virtual machine, a virtual machine is basically a software implementation of you know, the fundamental components of a computer. And what that means is essentially a memory space, so a, a block from which you can you know, allocate chunks of memory, uh, you know, a processor which you can you know, pass instructions to, and um, a set of registers which you can pass sort of as arguments these instructions to do computation. So uh, let's talk a little bit about about an actual machine, you know, about a computer. Uh, basically, the way the computer works is you have a, a bank of memory, and uh, we'll just say the memory uh, is indexed by a number. So you can get memory location 0 through uh, 10,000, let's say. And if you want the number that's in memory location 650, um, you can go and ask and query the memory for that um, for that information. Once you get data from memory, it goes into registers, which are locations on the processor itself, on the chip, that, uh, that hold information. <clears throat> Once you've sort of loaded the registers with information, you can run computations on them. So you can load two registers and then add them together and put the sum of those registers into a third register. Uh, that would be an add instruction. Um, the instructions can be simple, like that ad. They can also be very complicated. So um, on the VAX machine, there was actually a hardware um, instruction that would sort a list. So you gave it, uh, you know, 16 registers as 16 uh, operators or, or 16 parameters, and you gave it the sort um, instruction. And in hardware, there were physical, you know, uh, copper traces that would that did the sort algorithm for up to 16. Um, elements. So that's the way a real machine works. Uh, in the case of a virtual machine, everything is in software. So in other words, the implementation of your of your instructions, if you let's say you have a sort instruction, um, the sort is actually done in software. Um, and the sort is actually done by, you know, in this case, like using some for loops or whatever, which execute on the actual machine. Um, your registers are also just locations um, in memory on the actual machine. So there's no chip in this case because it's virtual. And your memory corresponds to memory in the actual machine. So that's not too different. So the interesting thing about a virtual machine is that, uh, for one thing, you can give it any instruction you want. You can make your own instructions because you're not actually doing anything in hardware. You're just composing new instructions from uh, you know the instructions that already exist on your machine. Um, you can also uh, you have you have more error checking. So if you let's say do a divide by zero um, in hardware, um, that's going to produce some answer. I mean, the, the electricity is going to flow through those wires, and something's going to happen. You're going to get a number. So it'll probably be... actually I think you get a sometimes you get an, ex an interrupt. Oh, you can get a, an interrupt. A divide by zero interrupt. Usually you get on Maybe. most OSs you know. get Keep a going. nan. Yeah, so usually you'll get a nan. It'll make there's some specific number board, yeah oh right that's right so there's some specific number that corresponds to not a number and you'll get that number um on the virtual machine if you do you know a floating point divide by zero or, or an integer divide by zero you can crash the virtual machine but uh 
you know, because the virtual machine is all done in software, you're not actually crashing something, you know, on the hardware level. And so it's much easier to debug. Uh, you know, one of the bad things about a virtual machine is that it's inherently slower. So if you call add, uh, well, add's kind of a bad example because it just calls the machine add. But let's say there's some, in, like, let's say there's some instruction called... Foo. Yeah, there's some instruction foo, which actually corresponds to doing 10 ads or something like that. Then, uh, you know, that's that instruction's actually going to be quite slow because it's going to, you know, actually turn into many different instructions. So... so oh, oh, go sorry, ahead. No, no, go uh, yeah, so basically a virtual machine sort of gives you a lot of control. You can see um, you know, exactly what's going on with the system. Since it's all in software, you can take a snapshot. So you can save the state of the virtual machine and then go back. So you can reload your crash over and over again and see exactly how it happened. Interesting. It also uh, provides portability. So uh, running across different actual processors, you can provide the same interface to your program. Yeah, definitely. So let's say, uh, <clears throat> for one example, uh, if your processor has SSE on it, you might have access to SSE hardware instructions that you know someone else doesn't have access to. Um, but in the case of the virtual machine, um, you all of your instructions are in software. So as long as you can compile the virtual machine for your particular computer, um, you know that you have access to every single instruction. And interesting things, which are another kind of gotcha, but, you know, the virtual machine on the computer with SSE could have SSE acceleration, but then you could run on another computer and assume that that's there because those instructions are still there, but that acceleration can't happen because there isn't right. a hardware, so that has to be done in software. Right, that's right. Yeah, so that's actually interesting. The virtual machine can run faster or slower depending on the specs of your actual machine and what instructions are actually there. So what's the difference between a virtual machine and an emulator? Oh, interesting. So that's a good question. Mm. Okay, I'll, I'll give my opinion. Okay, yeah, you may, go first. Then you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. But I mean, okay. uh, so, so an emulator, which we haven't talked about, is kind of taking a, a real world, and these are generalizations, but taking a real world um, device and so we we're talking about the Apple emulator online before the Apple IIe emulator. Um, so taking a heart of a real device and creating a program that runs on uh, other hardware, typically. So, for instance, in this case, uh, a Windows OS running on an Intel processor and simulating every as every hardware aspect of the Apple IIe that matters, so that you could take a program that was written for an Apple IIe. And without changing anything in that program, run it through your emulator and it would know no difference and it would behave the same and the user could interact with it if it's a you know user interacting kind of machine. Um, versus a virtual machine can implement essentially a hypothetical machine, a machine that doesn't exist in the real world. So Python doesn't implement a virtual machine that is a facsimile of another machine. It could have, you know, 1024 registers where no real you know, uh, machines going to have that many registers. It could have, right. in theory, a infinite stack that no hardware could actually have. Um, it can do stuff that isn't possible in real hardware, or even has just never existed in real hardware, and it's not bound to trying to emulate some other kind of hardware. Just providing a consistent interface to programs that are written for it. Yeah, I think that I think that makes sense. I think that you know the point. The biggest point there is the. Uh, the fact that, you know, like you said, the emulator is actually emulating another system, whereas you know a virtual machine can be completely virtual. But I guess um, fundamentally so they're the same, though. So. Yeah, I don't think that. I think a lot of it is connotative. You know, emulators are typically, you know, where you're going and trying to emulate a machine, uh, you know, a specific piece of hardware like a Nintendo or something, whereas a virtual machine is often referred to. Um, you know, emulating an operating system, like running, you know, Linux inside of Windows using VMware, something like that. Yeah. Or in this case, running uh, running a Python um, machine inside of a inside of a Windows or a C based machine. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the different Python uh, virtual machines. And okay. Why yep. Sorry, important. I got a, a little side talk there, but. <laughs> oh, it's good. It's good. So. Uh, so there's C Python, which is which is the original Python virtual machine, and it's as the name suggests, coded in C. Um, it uh, <clears throat> it's compiled for whatever you know actual machine you're running it on. So uh, if you're you know on Linux, you're using a 
Python virtual machine that was compiled for Linux. And there's a bunch of compile defines to try to, uh, you know, use the same code base on many different machines. Um, there's also stackless Python. And stackless Python is actually quite interesting. It uh, gives some extensions to Python that make it more uh, multi-core and multi-processor uh, friendly. And hmm. uh, do you know, have you ever used stackless Python? I have not. It has, uh, yeah, it does a lot more for multi-processing type stuff or parallel processing, right? Yeah, one interesting thing about stackless Python is it's used uh, by EVE Online, which is the, um, which, ho which boasts the largest uh, user base, largest single online server um, user base of any uh, multi-user environment. So there's, I believe there's tens of thousands of people on a single, um, you know, bank of servers that can all potentially interact with each other simultaneously using, uh, uh, you know, using EVE Online. So, you know, World of Warcraft has millions and millions of users, but uh, it's split up into several what's called shards. Um, actually, sorry, it's split up into several servers, and each server is split up into shards. So what that means is, um, let's say, you know, I might be playing on server... X and uh, Patrick is playing World of Warcraft on server Y, uh, we have no way of really, uh, you know, interacting with each other. We're in completely different, you know, universes. Uh, and so they're completely disjoint. So you can think of each of those as a completely different game. Uh, then on top of that, different areas of the world of a single server are sharded. So if I'm in one area and Patrick's in another area of the world, uh, we're on different physical servers. So in contrast with EVE Online, everyone can be in exactly the same location um, at one time. All of the users in the entire um, game. There are no, you know, there isn't multiple servers. And so they, they boast that they're able to do this because of stackless Python. So they can have gigantic flash mobs. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And there's, there's crazy news stories on the New York Times and other uh, papers on just, on just crazy things that have happened. I think one time... One uh, uh, one faction or one uh, I think it's called a corporation went to war on another corporation, and over the span of a few weeks, something like ten or twenty thousand dollars of real money, because apparently there's a conversion between real money and Eve Online money, uh, like twenty thousand dollars was lost in this battle. Um, it's just insane the the kind of the magnitude. Hmm. And and so yeah, Stackless Python works basically by uh, enhancing Python using something called tasklets, which are um, actually I think in Python they're not called tasklets. I think they're called micro threads. Uh, but basically, just to explain it briefly, um, you know, variables and data. Uh, you know, when you're when you're doing programming, <clears throat> um, certain uh, you might have access to a certain uh, you know set of data, and you're doing computation, and you might say, okay, I uh, I want to sort both of these arrays. There's just these very large arrays, and uh, I need to sort both of them. Um, what I'm going to do is create two threads. And in the first thread, I'm going to sort the first array. And in the second thread, I'll sort the second array. And if you have a multi-core um, CPU, it can do both of those things simultaneously. And that gives you, you know, a 2x speed up uh, in time. So stackless Python is very uh, has a very high affinity to being able to create threads. Uh, typically, when you create another thread, you have to sort of tell it what variables are yours, what variables are mine, and you have to create um, what's called a frame for that thread. Uh, with stackless Python, you, you can create micro threads, which uh, don't have a frame um, and don't require, don't have a context. And uh, because of that, it runs extremely fast. So if you need to create a lot of threads, um, you can do so very efficiently. So to go back to EVE Online, uh, they might have, you know, a thread for every player um, that's, you know, that's constantly updating the player statistics and things like that. And uh, that what that's uh, that architecture is what allows them to scale to that um, to those levels. So we got C Python, Stackless Python, any others? Yeah. So there's PyPy, which is a um, Python virtual machine written in Python. And uh, I always thought that this was sort of an educational thing. Uh, something that Python developers can use to learn more about the language. But uh, I'm learning more now that Python, that PyPy actually runs Python code faster than C Python. And um, it gets really hairy as to why this is, but 
basically it boils down to um, again coming down to these uh, frames. So in C Python, every time you enter a new function, it has to create a new frame. So if you uh, create a new variable inside of a function, it has to know that that variable is with that function. And when you return out of the function, that variable needs to be destroyed. So um, you know the set of all variables inside of a function is called a frame. Local and, uh, variables. Yeah, local variables. That's right. So uh, C Python, I guess the frames uh, require a lot of overhead, and as you're calling functions and returning out of functions, you're wasting a lot of time. And PyPy somehow uh, gets around this by using something called virtualizables. So uh, yeah, I still have more to learn there, but it is another uh, Python virtual machine to consider if you're developing in Python and performance is important. They also do a, a number of interesting tricks, which uh, probably we're running a little long in time tonight, so we won't necessarily talk about, but uh, just-in-time compilation and stuff as well, right? Yeah, I mean, just really quickly, the way that kind of works is, um, you know, computers like absolute numbers. I mean, if you have a loop and you're trying to loop through these items in a list and uh, you loop from one to the size of the list, but you don't really know what the size is, the size could be changing. Uh, computers, you know, they can't optimize that um, because they don't really know every time they go through this loop, they don't know if this is going to be the last time or not. Um, what a just-in-time compiler does is it's able to say, okay, I know that the size isn't going to change in the next millisecond. So I'm going to lock that down and I'm going to tell the system, you know, the actual machine that I'm looping from 1 to 30 instead of from 1 to the size of the list. And so, yeah, because of just-in-time compilation and being able to limit what things are changing and at what times, um, the actual machine is able to run much faster. Interesting, interesting. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything else to add on Python? So much stuff to add, I'm sure, but... Uh... I think we I think we covered it fairly well. I mean, at least at a, a introductory level slash deep level, we kind of been bouncing around a little, but I think that's good. It'll cover all parts of our audience. Yeah, I think that you know you can you know people who are just learning Python or learning programming for the first time can sort of go back later and learn more about you know virtual machines and things like that um, by you know listening to this podcast a second time. And people who are you know really experts can uh, hopefully. Uh, learn one or two things from from uh, from us today. Definitely, and I'd be happy if they listen to it once. We'll worry about them listening to it the second time uh, <laughs> later. Right. Let's get enough people listening to it the first time. Yeah, that's right. So uh, on that, I guess as a conclusion, uh, I don't know if you're listening to this. You probably found us on either our website or on iTunes, but we are now on iTunes, so that's a little bit of a yay. Yeah, um, that's awesome. And we're we're starting to get a few comments and ratings in. So if you like what you hear. Or if you don't, remember, Jason said, the, how if you think we're terrible, just give us a five-star rating and make us feel so bad that you think <laughs> that we're terrible and yet you still gave us a five-star rating. Um, That's right. And if you liked yeah. us, give us a five-star rating and tell us how great we did. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And if uh, you know, if you have any comments, uh, you can email us, programmingthrowdown at gmail.com, or you can post on our blog, programmingthrowdown.blogspot.com. Yeah, absolutely. In all fairness, we really would like to have uh, any sort of criticisms you guys have, constructive or otherwise, um, just so that we can try to make this better. We're doing this to help you guys uh, and to have a great time. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I guess I guess that wraps this one up, unless you have anything else. All right, so that's us signing off. See you guys later. Bye. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, and adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.